Yeah, so my, my first uh, slide is actually part of my timing. So maybe I'll just do the 30 seconds now and then share it. Is that okay? Yeah, no, that works for me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mine is not super long. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, this is not part of my day job. Uh, I have no expertise in this. And I actually just started this as sort of like a hobby project late last year. And it was not meant to be a lightning talk. So you be the judge whether this is good for this format. It took me a long time to get it from like an hour long talk to uh, five minutes. Um, but uh, yeah, so hopefully you enjoy it. And I've intentionally kept it not very technical, but I have a bunch of backup slides. If you want to ask technical questions, go for it. Uh, I intentionally didn't look up any theory when I started doing this because I just wanted to enjoy playing with the problem. Uh, but I looked up some just for this talk. So if you if you ask me questions, I won't be completely sort of baffled. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna start timing myself now. Okay. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, so today I'm gonna share with you a cool problem I recently came across. It kind of falls at the intersection of economics, game theory, complex systems, and I believe machine learning. Uh, so the ideas are not new, uh, but I, I, I think they might be somewhat overlooked as people have been heavily focusing on the more modern approaches. Uh, and I hope to inspire you to take a closer look at some of the old literature, especially if you're interested in multi-agent systems. Okay, so El Farol Bar, it's located on Canyon Road in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where coincidentally the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems is also located. Uh, Brian Arthur, an Irish mathematician and economist of the Santa Fe Institute, was very fond of their Thursday night's Irish music special, uh, but wasn't so fond of the rowdy crowd that sometimes gathered. Uh, so as any self-respecting mathematician would do, he set out to solve a very selfish and practical problem of trying to decide which nights he should attend and when he should skip. And his investigation eventually led to his very influential 1994 paper in which uh, he explores what he calls inductive reasoning. Um, so in contrast to deductive reasoning, no analytical solution is possible and the appropriate strategy is very much based on each person's own experience leading to what is sometimes referred to as an ecology of predictors, uh, that they evolve collectively by the members of the community that are attempting to solve the same problem. Okay, so here's the problem. So let's assume there are 100 people in town who would like to attend on Thursday nights, while only 60 can comfortably fit in. And no prior communication or coordination is allowed, at least in its most simple form of the problem. And the only information available to everyone is the number of M previous attendances, uh, say published in the newspaper every Friday morning. And each person has a binary decision to make every week, to go or not to go. And this decision will obviously be made based on their forecast of how many people will show up. Okay, so let's make some interesting observations. Um, so first of all, you can easily verify that no shared forecast can ever be accurate. For example, if everybody thinks that 87 people will go, nobody will go because that's beyond the threshold of 60, uh, then that negates the whole forecast. So this is an example of a self-defeating prophecy. And as people continue to adjust their strategies, uh, new rules for actions are themselves soon undone simply by their own success. Uh, leading to a red queen scenario where you have to evolve or adapt as fast as you can just to stay in the game. Uh, so let's do a simple numerical exploration. Um, so we assume each person can choose between n number of strategies that predict this week's forecast using the attendance numbers from the past m Thursdays. Uh, so, for example, one strategy could be always predict the same number as last week and so on. So you can make these up. Uh, and after each Thursday, once the attendance number becomes available, each person's current best strategy is updated. So in my example, which I'll show you the results for, these strategies are randomly generated linear models. Uh, if you want to know about the details of implementation, ask me later. Okay, so I will show you results from two different sets of parameters. So first, uh, let's start, let's look at the nominal conditions where m equals 5 and n equals 10, 
Uh, so remember, that means that the attendance from the past five Thursdays are used by each person. And also each person has 10 strategies to choose from. Uh, so what we actually see is that the attendance rate quickly converges to the threshold value of 60. Uh, so the town very efficiently solves the problem. So here the concept of an intelligent agent becomes fuzzy. Uh, so individuals don't necessarily do well, but the town as a whole solves the problem. Uh, so another example of a similar system is an ants colony where each ant is not very intelligent, but the colony as a whole shows very intelligent adaptive behavior. Interestingly, this also results in a very bimodal distribution of success seen from the perspective of the agents. Uh, so while the average is around what it's supposed to be, there are very successful and very unsuccessful people in town, and that's just based on the initial conditions. Okay, let's look at another example. So let's say, what if we make these people more sophisticated? Instead of having 10 strategies to choose from, each person gets 20. And what we find out is that actually the system becomes unstable. Uh, so the average is still around 60, uh, but very large fluctuations. Uh, so this is not unrelated to how markets could become unstable when sophisticated algorithms start competing with each other. Okay, so why is this a good toy problem? Um, so first of all, it gives us knobs to control different types of uh, agents. So these could be individuals, uh, groups, or the whole town. Uh, so we can explore the utility of more knowledge. We can explore the levels of intelligence, meaning more memory, better strategies, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, or finally, we can explore the role of pure luck as the results are very, very sensitive to the actually seed of the random num number generator you use. Okay, so here are some options uh, to play for yourself. Um, so there is a simple Python implementation of the environment that I've made that you, you're welcome to have a look. Uh, so it's meant to facilitate uh, what I was interested in originally is to try reinforcement learning on this. Um, and if you just want to play without dealing with any code, you can check out NetLogo, which is, you might have played with as a kid. It's a simple agent-based modeling tool, which is freely available. Thank you very much. So here are the references and links, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, awesome. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, will your slides be available anywhere? Uh, I can I can send them to you. Okay, awesome, perfect. Uh, one of the great things about being host is I can just like ask questions first, and no one can stop me. Um, so the the first one is so is there any relationship between the number well, obviously, there is some relationship between the number of strategies and the uh, the chance of like having a divergent result or an unstable result. Uh, is there any formula that describes like when that boundary condition is met? And uh, none that I know of. Um, and so, one of the reasons I guess I started this problem, I wanted basically try train a reinforcement learning agent on it, which basically means infinite number of strategies. You should be able to adapt to anything. So I don't think the number of strategies in a sense is important. It's just what is the, I guess, how fast do you adapt given the situation? And if you have too many strategies to choose from, I guess that rate of adaptation is uh, more. Actually, Elena might know something about this because the first generation of people trying to solve this, they use genetic algorithms to tackle the problem. But I haven't looked at that literature. I mean, there's also the question of what are sort of realistic numbers, how would this play in reality? I doubt that people actually have 10 different strategies that they choose out of. I would imagine it would be maybe less than five or, or so, you know, mm -hmm. it went up or down over the, people are more likely to keep a longer history perhaps, but even the, then, yeah, they're not gonna make very sophisticated uh, strategies off of it. I have a question. Go for it, Techie. So you'd mentioned that it was really sensitive to initial conditions, whether it diverged or not, really sensitive to, the, to which seed was picked. Is it more divergent with more strategies or is it is it more sensitive with more strategies or less sensitive with more strategies? Do we know that? Um. Yeah, so with more strategies, so it's not so much, so, okay, so maybe I wasn't clear that sensitivity to the seed doesn't affect 
the eventual solution of the problem. You always reach that 60 or you become unstable. So those always happen. So what you're sensitive to is if you care about, let's say person number five out of 100, their performance is very, very dependent on how it all started and what strategy did they start with first. So they might end up uh, going to an empty bar more times or always sort of getting kicked out. And that was sort of completely chaotic. Actually, it's a chaotic system. It's, a, it's fully deterministic, but chaotic system. Uh, hey, Pam. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Very interesting problem. Uh, you mentioned two cases. Uh, what about border cases? Is this system has some convex stability or just going wild on the border or have more sophisticated behavior like several maximum or minimums? Or... Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen like if you play around with the different numbers, uh, which you can do in the net logo, uh, it's you, you can see all sorts of behavior. Sometimes it's semi stable for a while, and then goes out of control. Sometimes you get periods that are longer, sometimes it's shorter. Um, I think it's just the dynamical system and it's chaotic and depending on exactly, I don't have the actual, uh, I haven't, to be honest, looked up the actual solution of the but, problem, but I think you can probably see the so, full yeah, diagram. Yeah. Maybe the question is, is there a number of parameters where system go going to be stable in time or it's always yeah, so wild? Yeah, it's not always wild. So the the first case I showed, that's that's the stable case. So there is, if the memory, so memory doesn't really affect it, but as long as the number of strategies doesn't, isn't too big, it's always stable. It always reaches that threshold. And oh, okay. Um, but I don't know the actual theoretical, I think they exist, but you can look them up. The, so the actual it looks theoretical. like it, it's kind of local maximum or minimum. And then you change parameters and there's another convex and then, but if there are some parameters where it's unstable, completely unstable. Uh, so that's the second case I showed. So that is a completely unstable case, right? When you go from N equals 10 to 20, then it just fluctuates. So it doesn't what? look like completely unstable. It's uh, with big amplitude, but it's kind of stable. Like, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe, you're right. Uh, yeah, the average actually is correct. It's still around 60, which is supposed to be, but it's depending on the week, it's uh, very high or very low. I guess I was thinking of that as unstable, but uh, obviously you can't go any more than 100 and you can't be any less than zero. So it's just the fluctuations that are mm -hmm. the problem. Are there some optimum combination of parameters? Uh, is there is, yeah. So that, So this is... Uh, I was telling Matt before the meeting. So this is a solved problem. So there is a unique, uh, what they call symmetric Nash equilibrium, which means oh, okay. it's a strategy that is optimum for everyone, given the number of the threshold and the number of people in town. So you can just calculate it. Uh, but it is a mixed strategy, which means that you don't do a deterministic thing. You have to randomly select between your strategies. And if everybody does that, basically everybody is doing the best they can do. Cool. And there is a formula for it, but I didn't talk about it. Thanks. No problem. So you've already made the connection with um, chaos theory. I was curious because what you showed looked like a, um, a, a, I can't remember what the technical term for it is, but it's like a, a two period oscillation. Um, so there were two values that it sort of fluctuated between. Um, if you increase the um, the number of strategies, does it do, are there more bifurcations? Like, does it go to a four period, then eight period, and then purely chaotic? It's uh, a good question. Uh, I actually haven't tried it. The problem is, I guess, uh, so it did net logo one. Let me just show you for a second. Um, so in my Python, I can do it, but it just gets slow, so I didn't try it. But in the, do you see that screen? So this is the dead logo simulation part. And so if you go memory size, so this is M5, N10, and the threshold 60. Uh, and if you just run it, so you would see the first graph that I showed. So it just sort of uh, fluctuates a little bit. So again, depending on, so every time you do it, it's gonna be uh, slightly different. So it is 
somewhat uh, dependent on the uh, seed. Uh, but the problem is they don't really allow it to go beyond the n equals 20. Um, so if you try it, so basically the fluctuations get larger, but it doesn't ever seem to, so you do see something like beets, um, but uh, yeah, you, I never see it go completely off the chart to 100 and down, but it gets pretty close. What about changing the memory size? Yeah, so let's do that. So let me get this all out. Oops, <laughs> I guess <laughs> ah. that breaks the thing. That's what it does. Uh, so maybe let's keep the number of strategies a little bit lower. I've been trying the one online and it breaks it if you don't redo the setup before you run it sometimes. Mm. Yeah, so this one looks like it's converging, right? All right, let's check that access. Oh. This is not converging. Mm -hmm. I guess that the part that I'm actually interested in, because I guess in if you actually want to use this for anything, you don't have control over the town. And the problem is not to solve the town's mm -hmm. problem, right? The problem is you are one of those people and you want to go there. So right. That's a very difference. And that's the reason I did the environment. I'll just show you. Um, so I've created an environment where each person can make a decision and then you run it and uh, <laughs> just so. So it might take, uh, so maybe I'll just, that's if you increase the number of strategies, it takes a bit of time. So, yeah. uh, but so maybe I'll just do this. Yeah. Sorry, I, should run. I just wanted to show you that what I'm actually caring about, oh, I guess the plots are here, so I can show you. Yeah. Uh, so I have these prides, which is the agent's performance. So this is each agent uh, so yeah. from zero to 100. Mm. Uh, and you can see some of them do way better and then some of them do way worse. So mm. I care about picking one of these agents and trying mm. to beat the system. That's right. what I want to try to do. And then you get these bimodal ones where some people do really bad and some people do really good. And I want to know what affects who does what. Right. Very cool. Yeah. But yeah, so this you can play around with yourself. Uh, this is not a super efficient code. As you can see, slower than uh, than the net logo, but uh, but it, it works. So this is the stable one. Does, it, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, I, I have an additional one. I, I could I have many additional ones, but uh, the agents they don't have any knowledge about the other, uh, like the other agents, right? Like they they don't even know what the previous agents have done in the past. So everybody knows the count of the bar attendance every week. That's about it. You don't know about okay. other people, but that's one of the. There's so many variations since 1994 that people you can even start right. telling people whether you go or not, and you can choose to lie or be be honest. And there's all those variations that are super interesting to look into. Very cool. Okay, this is this is the last. Oh, uh, will you share your code? Uh, yeah, I, I think I actually. Yeah, it's already in the code. slides, so yeah, yeah, I'll share the slides and you can. Yeah, send that over again. Okay, uh, so that is it. Okay, thank right. you. Thanks again. Really, really good one. Thanks. So uh, next we have Bruce, who is doing uh, COVID nineteen uh, modeling. Uh, just like a, a little thing, Bruce. I forgot to mention. Uh, if you want to mm -hmm. go see me give you hand gestures, uh, just make sure to pin my video. Ah. Um, I won't look for hand gestures. Uh, oh, you know what? I accidentally, there we go. I accidentally pinned Paya. Uh, but yell at me if there's anything that I need to know. <clears throat> okay, let's get going here. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about COVID-19 modeling, modeling, and really this is just the basics of COVID-19 modeling. So it'll be a little more uh breadth than depth, I guess. Uh, I'm uh, totally unqualified to give a presentation like this. I'm just a concerned citizen who wants to understand the stuff that I hear in daily briefings and modeling briefings and stuff like that. But there's lots of interesting data science related to COVID-19. So 
having said that, let's go. So before I talk about what the models are, let's talk about why you want to have them. And the basic thing is that it can help us answer questions about how to respond to the pandemic. Like, What if we do nothing? Or what if we do something? Are our are interventions working? What about the super spreader stuff? And just generally, how are we doing? <clears throat> so what I hope you can take away from this talk is just to better understand some of the things that you hear about all that. The most widely used models uh, for COVID-19 are in this category of uh, compartmental models. And the idea is you take the entire population and you put them into these four compartments or, or buckets. Uh, here, uh, are, you haven't been uh, infected yet, you're, so you're susceptible. Here, you have been infect, infected, but you're not infecting other people. And here, you are in, infecting other people. And then finally, you're removed from the model. Uh, either because uh, you've recovered or you've died. There are transition rates between each of these stages or each of these uh, compartments. And that leads to this set of differential equations. And then there's these uh, three parameters, alpha, beta, gamma, that describe uh, the model. You can solve these equations uh, numerically and for S, E, I, R, all these things. and uh, this curve here, the green one, is sort of related to, it's not exactly, but it's related to the daily case counts that you hear in the daily briefings. Like today, there was 427 new cases. That's this is the sort of thing that you can predict. And this answers the question of what if we do nothing? You just let it run free. Well, this is what's going to happen. You get more cases and they die off because eventually there's nobody left to be infected. So when you go to the modeling briefings, they'll present charts like this, and they're, this is what they're doing. They're taking those daily case counts, which the black stuff, and fitting it to a model like that. And then they start adjusting the parameters and say, well, what if we lock down more or we open up more? What's that going to do to the case counts? And you get these what-if scenarios. So it guides the decision-making process. Related to all this is the fairly famous number R, the effective reproductive number. Uh, a reproduction number. It's a descriptive statistic. It get, kind of tries to summarize a lot of things. Uh, it's the average number of people who are infected by an infectious person. So any virus has sort of a natural R called R naught. And uh, if you just let it run free, uh, well, how many people get infected per person? In the case of COVID-19, that's been determined to be in the range of two to three. And this comes out of the, the model that uh, we just saw, it's a ratio of those two parameters. Uh, you'll see charts like this. Uh, R is not uh, constant. It is affected by the interventions that you do. And the whole idea is to drive R below one, because if it's below one, the epidemic dies out. If it's above one, you're exponentially exploding. Pretty imperfect uh, because it is just an average of a distribution, but it's okay because it's simple and easy to understand and you can estimate it with available data like daily case counts. In fact, I estimate it every day, twice uh, with two different ways and I'll come back to why that is. Uh, we've all heard about variants of concern. Uh, this is directly relevant to R. When you hear that B117 may increase transmissibility by 40 to 80%, that's really just saying there's going to be a multiplier on R. On a good day in BC, R might be 0.9. Uh, a variant could bump that up to 1.4. So we go from a regime where it's okay and under control and to something that's really bad, bad, bad. But R doesn't tell the whole story. It's a mean of a distribution. Uh, what's also interesting is what's the spread of that distribution. K is a dispersion parameter that characterizes that. COVID-19 is described as an over-dispersed uh, distribution uh, in the sense that uh, here's the distribution. It's a negative binomial. It's in green. Uh, it's over-dispersed because it's just broader than a Poisson distribution, which doesn't describe what's going on there as well. This chart's kind of incomprehensible, but it's a really interesting paper uh, that's just referenced at the bottom. The bottom line is the, the super spreader phenomenon. 80% of the infections are caused by 20% of the people. That's a, that's a really key point that a lot of people don't appreciate. And it has a lot to do with how you want to manage the pandemic. So I've talked about daily case counts quite a bit. They're a key input to all these models. The raw numbers are, are quite noisy, as you can see the red line here. Uh, so if you want to work with these numbers, you need to smooth them out. Lots of ways to do that. A seven-day moving average is one good ingredient. There's a lot of weekly variation. 
Uh, I prefer using CDC numbers to the daily briefings. Weirdly, those numbers aren't quite the same. Uh, but I also do something that most people don't, which is I make a conscious effort to adjust for the number of tests that happen on a given day. The number of tests that's shown in this graph here is highly variable, even from, from day to day. There's reasons for these changes. There's slow changes because there's just test strategy changes or just prevalence of the virus in the population changes. But there's these fast changes because it's a weekend or the lab capacity is unknown. People get distracted and they go one day instead of another day for getting their tests done. So the what I do is I smooth the tests by a moving average and then I use that to adjust the daily case counts. So the net effect of all that is you can get, uh, it has an effect on the R calculations. So this is why there's two columns in my R uh, table. The first column is uh, numbers you get from a test adjusted estimate and the ones uh, not test adjusted. And then it's helpful for visualizations as well. This is a kind of a crazy graph, but uh, it's smoothed out and it very much gives you a picture of how things uh, are playing out right now. There's agent-based modeling, which is uh, kind of layered on top of these uh, compartmental models. And it's instead of solving differential equations, the idea is you define agents representing people, they have specific characteristics, and then you just run a simulation, you let them interact and self-organize. This is good because it's easier to account for things like clusters and quarantines and closures and age and stuff like that. And that's it. Nice. You had uh, ten seconds left. I know. I could have I could have crammed in another slide. <laughs> hmm. Anyone have uh, questions? I haven't no formulated question. one yet. Um, uh, yeah, so the super spreader phenomenon you mentioned, so 80% yeah. of infections caused by 20% of people. Do we know, is that, is that roughly the same among all the different variants? Uh, I don't think we know that yet. Um, the main thing that has been studied with the variants is this transmissibility uh phenomenon and the increase in transmissibility uh although people are very concerned about also are they going to be you know cause more death they're going to be hit people harder basically have more severe impact i haven't heard about this clustering phenomenon whether that's known we, we were just barely got a handle on these variants as it is yeah right fair enough thank you i have a question about the reported numbers you mentioned that they're different in the CDC and the daily briefings. And I saw that little footnote on their dashboard too. And do you know, like, are they different totals overall or is there just a delay in there because they do a daily briefing when they don't have the full daily numbers or something? There's two things going on. There is a delay. Well, they're, they're just the time period that they're reporting on is different. I don't know why it's crazy. And if you look at the dashboard, you'll see, and you look at their chart, you'll see the number is different from the number that it reports in the upper right corner, which is the daily case count that, that we hear about. Uh, but the more important thing is often um, they find out there, there was just mistakes in the reporting or they found some old tests that weren't included. And the daily case numbers never correct for that. But the CDC, the database that they keep, they go back and fix up the old numbers based on new information. And therefore it's more accurate. And it, it smooths things out a lot. The, uh, yeah, so that's that's why I prefer it. Okay, interesting. Thank you. I've been wondering about that for so long. <laughs> <laughs> could could Bruce? you? Go, oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, could could you go to the differential equations? That's something you don't hear every day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, dr uh, over dt. Uh, so uh, the the rate of recovery or removed, uh, shouldn't that include vaccine as well? But how do you account for vaccine? It, oh, it should, expect? yeah. So this okay. is the very most simplest version of these equations. Okay. Uh, it, it doesn't include vaccines, and there's nothing in here about how interventions might play into it. So the models that, you know, where I, I showed the... Uh, uh, show these kind of charts. They actually include a lot of those effects in it and do a much more sophisticated modeling than this. So this is this is really just a starting point. Okay. One of the reasons I like these agent-based models, though, th these 
differential equations, it gets harder and harder to sort of layer on these specific effects. Uh, whereas the agent-based models, it's easy to say, this person has this characteristic and we have so many of these kind of people and then just let, her, let it go. Mm -hmm. Do we know if the BCCDC actually uses agent-based models or they still do the differential equation and stuff? I've never heard of them talking about agent-based models. Uh, and the, Well, but then they also don't talk about differential equations either. They just say models. Well, that's true. True enough. They talk about compartmental modeling and just from my, well, actually, I, I'm sorry. But I mean, uh, the agent-based can be compartmental as well, right? I mean, the agents enough, still yeah. go through those states. So I, I, the first answer I gave to your question was, was not correct. They, they published a paper and it was a, a differential equation based model basically. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah. I would be amazed if they don't have like six different models that they run kind of all the time and see what the different models are saying. Yeah. Well, maybe, but you know, I've listened to talks from you know David Coombs and and Carolyn Colleen uh, at UBC and SFU respectively, or some of the people behind these models that are used in BC. And I've never heard them talk about agent-based models. Yes, so it's that's interesting. Related. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Payan. So I was just gonna. It's, my question was exactly related to what you're discussing, and I, so my understanding was that agents agent-based models have been largely abandoned in many fields because they're very hard to calibrate. So you can fool yourself that you know what the parameters are to generate the kinds of things that you're seeing and be completely wrong. And there's no guarantees that what you're modeling is actually true. Oh, but that, yep. that goes for the other ones as well. I don't, I don't see that really as a differentiation. Yeah, I th they both have their, their strengths and weaknesses. I think one interesting uh, case uh, where agent-based models were used, and I, and I believe this is true, but I'm not 100% sure, but in Australia, or the state of Victoria in Australia, which is in many ways very similar to BC and where we were just a few months ago, they decided they wanted to go for COVID zero. They were just going to lock down everything until they got to uh, basically zero cases a day, but not exactly zero. They, so they wanted to know when can they actually you know, back off these very harsh restrictions that they put in place. And I heard a talk from somebody and he talked about running hundreds of simulations. Uh, my impression was it was agent-based uh, to come to a conclusion where they had to get down to five new cases a day and they felt they could manage it from that point on. So they really set that target and based on the outcome of those models. So um, I have a question. My understanding that is that in BC, not so much testing is done if you compare it to other jurisdictions. So um, the, the results you presented are based on confirmed cases. Um, do they account for um, not confirmed cases and the, the sort of limited amount of testing that's taking place here? Not really. I mean, I mentioned how I try to smooth out the, the testing, the short-term fluctuations in testing, but uh, no, you're exactly right. I, I'm just showing a, a portion of the number of tests graph here, but it, it varies a lot over time, long fluctuations. I don't really know why that uh, we're not doing more tests. The positivity rate is in the range of six to eight, nine percent. It's it's been in the last few months. That's not considered good. You're considered to be doing enough testing. Your positivity rate's more like three percent or or better. Uh, when things were under control earlier last year here in BC, our positivity rate was less than a percent. I think a lot of times. Um, so um, why we're putting up with so little testing, so high a positivity. I don't, I don't understand it, and it, it definitely makes the data less reliable. But I mean, there's a, the relationship between number of tests and number of cases is not in one direction; it's bidirectional, right? I mean, if there's less sure. prevalence, fewer people are gonna go get themselves right. tested. Um, so I'm not yeah. really sure, like, what you're gonna do? Just start randomly asking people, "Hey, don't you want to get?" tested even if you don't have no symptoms like but i think well there, there are all sorts of rules and regulations just to get a test you have to you know they have um, things on a web page do you have this 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 and this and you know after 10 15 different things then potentially you can get a test so um that, that's why i was just looking at i'm not sure that's the case anymore it was like that in the early days bruce do you know whether that's still the case or I, ducky i i don't know for sure my ducky may know better uh do you, I, I don't know for sure. I will tell you that in June I had a cold. I called 811 and said, so here are my symptoms. And they were pretty mild. And they said, yeah, you should go get a test. 
My uh, impression the, the, was you can just show up at a testing facility if you want to test, and they'll test you. That was my yeah. I think I think I, you can. So it, it has I, something I to do with how people show up. I don't think that's always the case, actually. Sorry, to mm. like I know of people yeah. who had no symptoms but were like a couple of degrees away, or like you know, were very worried that they had been exposed, and they would not give them a test. Now mm. or like like pretty recently. in March, yeah, like a month recently. ago. Interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I think the other thing that happens is that there's an if there's maybe an official policy and the testing uh sites might bend the rules mm. i think i believe a friend of mine went and got didn't have any symptoms and went and got tested but i don't know what kind of a story he was able to tell the testing site it's like oh yeah my next door neighbor who i chatted with over the garbage cans uh, was exposed, and so I, I, I needed a test. I, I, I don't know. Well, different they might have site, different sites may may need dif a different, and different people at different sites may demand different amounts of strictness to get give someone a test. Well, it probably mm -hmm. depends. They probably have a priority list and a capacity list, right? So it's like, how many tests can we do today versus? You know, and where do you fall? It's like a triage at a hospital sort of thing. Yeah, if you walk up and they're bored, you get a test, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, if, if if there's no one there sort of thing and they can do a test, it's, it's, it's a data point for them. But if it's vital to find out if someone has COVID and they're, you know, they've got more severe symptoms, then they're up that triage list. I, yeah. I don't know if that's the case, but I would hope they have that sort of uh, priority listing in place. Yeah. I think so Bruce, the... Oh. the province as a whole we're not near capacity in terms of what they can do but it could yeah. be unevenly distributed over testing centers as in some could be busier than others yeah. and also yeah, we have health the capacity authorities. to do way more tests mm, and health authorities yeah i know they have uh, just one more thing about what can affect the number of tests is how aggressively you're contact tracing and i i think at the numbers we've got today they can't they can't keep up although you'd think with the number of cases we got if they were contact tracing we'd, we'd see more tests but Sorry, there was another question. Uh, yeah, the, the super spreader phenomena, that's not limited to a BC phenomena, right? Like that—that that is the no. same, that's just a property. It's a characteristic it's of, the of the virus. Yeah. yeah. And somewhat related question, can you comment on that parameter K a bit more? Can Is that actually affected by interventions or is that no. completely given by the oh, virus? Oh, sorry. Uh, that's a good question. Is it fact, yeah, I guess it, I guess it would be sure. Um, if you could somehow pre-identify who the super spreaders are and just isolate those people, you could well, knock the, K way way back. The the other thing is that in BC we have reduced K by uh, not allowing large events and by saying you can't meet yeah. with people outside your household. So that's one way to shrink K. But I I think that there ought to be some K naught, which is what the dispersion is yeah. in a naive population with no restrictions. So maybe. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that's right. And, and K, just like R, is affected by your interventions. <coughs> that just makes sense. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but the, the main effect of knowing K is it it can influence your the type of contact tracing you do. Mm -hmm. There's backwards contact tracing versus forward. And it's not clear that we're doing that here. Okay. Uh, we are. I, I'm pretty sure we're doing at least some backwards contact tracing because Dr. Henry talked about doing backward tracing for the. She she mentioned explicitly doing backward tracing for uh, people who had the variants of concern. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, true. We're that's true. we're out of time. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the hot topic. <laughs> Very hot. Yeah. hot but something that we will uh, be able to touch on again, I think, uh, after, well, one, we can touch on it uh, for that Kegel meetup, but uh, two, uh, after all the talks, we can just kind of have a free for all. Uh, so the the next talk is Programmer Productivity uh, with Ducky. And I will be doing the slides for this one. So just give me a little, some time to set this up. And Matt, I'm gonna I'm gonna run my own time, so okay. that I don't have to look at you. Sure. Wow. I'm just gonna look at my at, at my uh, slides and at, at the camera. Okay. Uh, just make sure I don't need to I need to pin you. 
Uh, do, 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 pin video. Okay. Go ahead. Start. All right. So, hello, everybody. I'm here to tell you that your ideas about programmer productivity are all wrong and how you can become a more productive programmer yourself. So, everybody knows that there's a hundred to one difference between the best programmers and the worst programmers. Something like this histogram of the time to complete one task. Well, I studied programmer productivity in grad school, and I can tell you that this chart is complete horseshit. It's not 100 to 1. It's in, in oh, sorry, Matt, please switch. Okay. So I just want to make sure that it's this. I am sorry. It's, it's okay. It's, I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot to switch. So this is the histogram that everybody thinks. And switch again, please. This is what actually it looks like. This is what the research so, shows. It's not 100 to 1, it's infinity to 1. I am infinitely, infinitely better than a walrus because you know those flippers make it hard to type. But you say that's not fair, walruses don't count. But there was a contractor in my team once who did not check in his code at all for a year. And after a year they finally fall, fired him. So he was actually just exactly as productive as a walrus. But that's not even the most important thing. Uh, notice how the hump is really shifted to the left, um, which makes sense. There's a million six ways that you can get slower, but not that many ways to get faster. That means if you're trying to build a team, the most important thing is not to hire rock stars, it's don't hire walruses. Work hard in your hiring to avoid people who spend all their time on the right side of the curve. But maybe you're think, still thinking you want to hire the best performers. Uh, this graph shows that the programmers at the, at the mode will still spend two to four times as long to solve a problem as the best. The only problem is that this is for one task. If you have a bunch of tasks, statistically, you would expect regression to the mean. The research is a little light in this area, but it supports that uh, regression to the, it supports the regression to the mean does happen. Um, now, most productivity research looks at speed because that's the easiest thing to measure. But there are other important things like quality, documentation, how useful the person is to the team, to, to cohesion. So even if you do find a rock star fast programmer, will they be good at the other things? Not even that, but even on coding tasks, most tasks don't need a rock star. You do not need Jeff Dean to write getters and setters. So stop trying to hire rock stars. Try to hire good, solid, competent people and avoid the walruses. Meanwhile, what can you do to become more productive yourself? First, don't be a walrus, duh. Uh, okay, how? Well, in my graduate school research, I watched professional programmers solve problems. And based on that, that my advice is don't get stuck. Again, how? Well, why do people get stuck? I believe it is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is putting more weight on things that confirm the idea that you already have in your head and ignoring evidence which contradicts the idea which is already in your head. This is very, very human. We all do it. Why do we do it? Well, it turns out that there are two different neural pathways in the brain, what I call the get done pathway. I'm uh, sorry, am I still, uh, sorry, please switch. There's the get done pathway and the creative pathway. And unfortunately, they inhibit each other. You get one or the other. Now, inhibiting your creative pathway is useful. You don't want your brain spending time, spending wasting cycles on X when you're trying to figure out Y. Inhibiting the pathway is a good thing when you're trying to get things done. Unfortunately, it's always also a bad thing at times. If you're focusing really hard on Y, that might prevent you from noticing that the problem really is an X. So this is why so frequently you'll find the solution to a problem when you're not focusing on it or maybe not even thinking about it at all, like in the shower or the walk. 
because you are not inhibiting the creative pathway. If you realize that you're stuck, then you can do something about it. Going for a walk is one thing, you, but it's kind of heavyweight. Instead, something you can do is you can try writing down three hypotheses of what the problem might be. The act of forcing yourself to come up with three hypotheses seems to be enough to free up the creative pathway for long enough that sometimes you get unstuck. Also, the act of explaining something, even to yourself, sometimes will show you where your logic was weak. Even better is to not get stuck in the first place, and this one simple trick can help. Hypothesize first. If this is the only thing you get out of this talk, then, th then I'll be happy that I have made a difference in the world. Hypothesizing all the different possible solutions is a fantastic way to, for you to keep from getting caught in confirmation bias. Your, your brain is then primed to try and disprove things instead of trying to prove things. There is some research where uh, hypothesizing first cut the problem solving time in half, in half. So in summary, when you're hiring, it is uh, much better to avoid uh, walruses than it is to hire rock stars. Write down three hypotheses if you see that you are stuck and hypothesize first to avoid getting stuck. That's all, thank you. Nice, <laughs> we got there. Sorry? <clears throat> I just said we got there. Uh, at first, was, <laughs> it, it, it took a little while for me to yeah, uh, get the uh, I get the timing right. And I, and I, I kept forgetting to signal, signal you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's all good. All right, uh, any questions? Oh, I, I can start, right. Uh, okay. So uh, I'm really curious. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in this, like from a, like an academic point of view. Uh, where does where do studies like this tend to get uh, uh, published? Is this like management science or software engineering? What would you consider this to be? Um, I found it in software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the buzzword at the moment. I. I think of it as programmer productivity. Yeah. Um, software engineering uh, research is yeah. one area. That, that's that's one buzzword. Yeah. Um, if you want, I can I can go look a little Could bit. Be it should in be. behavioral economics, maybe. I mean, it's possible that behavioral economics and uh, and MIS and other places do this too. I found it in the computer science research. Yeah. All right. Cool. Oh, Pyam, you're it, muted. Uh, oh. oh, sorry. Uh, I just had a Go question ahead. about your uh, third uh, advice. Uh, so are you saying it's not a capital mistake to hypothesize before one has data? Or uh, can you say a little bit more about what you mean by hypothesize first? Um, mostly this has to do with solving problems as opposed to invest exploring data. Um, so they're, they're a little bit different in that regard. When you're exploring data, you probably don't want to hypothesize first. That's a, that's a good observation. But um, the, the, the research that I, uh, that I based this recommendation on was uh, two groups of students who were given a, a problem uh, a task, and the task was to figure out what the repeat button on a programmable car did. And the one group of students was just handed the controller and said, go, figure it out. And the other student was, the other group was, they withheld the controller until the students had brainstormed for a few minutes about all the possible things. The students in the brainstorm first uh, group s solved the, the problem on average in six minutes, whereas the control group solved it in 19 on average. Um, now, this didn't count the hypothesizing time. I went and tracked down the professor and asked how long, and he said, oh, just a couple minutes. So if, they, if it was two more minutes, then it was half of the time. Um, so it was just really stunning how good it was. How good cool. I thought the first was. 
I have a question. I, I wonder if the characteristic of being a walrus or a rock star is somewhat problem specific as well, or does uh, does that type sort of generalize across the, the problems? Like, because I, I can think of people I've worked with in the past who are really good at some kind of problems, other problems they just flounder. Well, um, Matt, can you advance it? Uh, advance the slides two, please. So here's. There's, like I said, the research is a little bit light in this, mm -hmm. in the area of multiple problems. But here was something where they uh, asked 10 programmers to solve five problems. And you can see that, that there's real variation there. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's negative that they didn't manage to solve the problem. This is actions, and actions rough are a proxy for how much time they didn't. They didn't actually look at how much time. And I don't remember right now what an, an action was. But if you look at this, it's hard to tell who the rock star is and who the walrus is. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there isn't one. Like white. White doesn't, uh, isn't, you know, spectacular. Oh, sorry. Kind of this middle of the pack, action. always. Yeah. they. I mean, on, on the undo task, white takes significantly longer than orange, gray, purple, blue, or green. But white finished the scroll problem, and most of them did not finish the scroll problem. Mm -hmm. So is, is orange the rock star? I mean, you, you <laughs> can't really tell here. Um, mm. You can see that yellow really got stuck online and that blue really got stuck on scroll. So don't get stuck. The hardest thing that I personally have found is realizing when I'm stuck. That's the hardest thing. Can I ask you to clarify what you mean by stuck? Like, do you mean when you're setting up how to solve a problem or are you talking about when you're debugging and trying to figure out where an error is or what kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, like when you're debugging and you can't find where the, where the, where the problem is or it, it generally in debugging um, when you're when you're doing a design, it's a different type of thing usually. You, it is possible to get stuck when doing design. It's like, well, I really need it to be, I need it to be green and square, but I can't seem to get it to be. So it's harder to hypothesize about design problems. So has any of this um, uh, research that you've looked at kind of explored where this this problem might come from because the first thing that comes to me because i'm a new and like a recent graduate is that when we learn uh coding or any type of uh work in stem fields the way you're tested is you better know how like you better know the, the way to do it test situation or else you're gonna be hooped on it like you basically have to get there right away or else you can't really you won't have time to go back Right. This gets to one of my pet peeves is that debugging is not taught at all in academia. And it's, it's something that we spend an enormous amount of time on. Um, I believe that there are some things that could be taught with debugging, but that's for a whole nother talk. Maybe I, maybe I should do another lightning talk in a couple months on that. Um, you should. I haven't, I haven't, I, I'll be honest, I haven't thought about that much in about five years, so I'd have to come back to it. But what was your original question? You started like did, with, did, did the research, has the research that you looked at, uh, explored any of, any of the, the causes for this kind of phenomenon? The causes for which kind of, for why people think that way, like instead of why people get stuck. Why people? Yeah, why people don't necessarily take take the uh, this approach? Why they why they kind of dive ah. into a, to a problem and and get well, stuck I, rather I, I than? I think I think it's human nature that because the creative pathway interferes with the functional pathway. Once you're once you are trying to get something done, it's really really hard to break away from that and see some and look for other problems. Um, and I, I did a real quick look for 
uh, citation for there being two pathways in the brain, and I couldn't find it, and I don't have it written down, but I know I saw it. So, so the, the the name for this is the Einstein Lung problem, which is brain locking in German, I think. Uh, I might have that wrong. I'll I'll go find the the citation for that. But yeah, Thank it's, it's, it's a, a well known phenomenon in problem solving. Any advice? Interview advice? How do you identify walruses based on your experience? That's hard, but but interviewing is hard. Period. Um, and. If I knew the answer, it would take way more than 10 minutes to give it to you, I think. But just having the idea that speed of solving individual problems is not the best metric of success, I think is valuable. Because a lot of people think that there's a 100 to 1 difference between the speed of the fastest programmer and the slowest, and that, that's not true. I think that the mode or the average versus the fastest is a much, much more interesting and tractable problem. And there the difference just isn't that big. Now, uh, one, thing, one thing I should say is that in research, you have to keep the problems small. And so it is possible that for hard problems, there is a certain level of smarts or ability that you have to cross, a threshold that you have to cross in order to be able to solve that problem at all. But most of the problems that we deal with are not that hard. Um, I have never had to design the Google file system. You know, it, it, it's it just not, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't need that level. 99% of the things you do are not going to need that level. Uh, sorry, 99% of you know your company's thing uh, are not going to need that level. In terms of interviews, the most effective technique I've found is as an interviewer is to ask that the person just go up the whiteboard and write some code for a simple, simple ish problem. It, it, and, you know, it's a stressful situation. And you don't, you're not trying to throw them something hard. You just want to see how they think, how they approach a problem. What do they do when they get stuck? And they'll probably make a mistake and you point it out and you just want to see how they react and get past that. That that has correlated very well with their eventual success as an employee, in my opinion. And something that I think is a real bonus if somebody does this in the interview is if they start by saying, okay, what are my test cases? And writing out a, a few simple test cases uh, or test inputs. You know, I, I want zero, one, minus one, 99, lizard. Okay, those are my test cases. Now let me go ahead and, and write it. Because sometimes when you're writing the test cases, you'll figure out some corner case, cases that, are, that are, are sketchy, or you'll recognize that the problem as given was ambiguous and you need to, you need to get some clarification. And the, coming up with the test cases can help that. Uh, I tip, deliberately on. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Pro tip: When you are interviewing, start with the test cases. <laughs> well, here's another pro tip: uh, I deliberately underspecify the problem that I set because I want to see if they're going to ask me for clarification. If they just go bombing ahead and just jump right in, it's not a good sign. <laughs> That's very helpful. All right. Uh, one more question: If if anyone has one more question, the, we have time. I have a comment. It's sort of a question. Uh, I'm sure you know the phenomenon or the technique of rubber duck debugging. It's it's a little bit like formulating the hypothesis. That sounds a little intimidating to me to have to formulate three hypotheses. It sounds kind of fancy. The rubber duck debugging is the idea is there's a rubber duck sitting on a chair in a room and you go and explain your problem to that rubber duck. And just the fact of standing up, getting away from your terminal and articulating it out loud. Amazing how many problems that clears up. Yes. Rubber ducking is also very good. Um, yeah. I like, I like doing the three hypotheses, particularly if I'm in a better than rubber ducking, particularly if I'm in, off, in an office environment because I feel stupid talking to the rubber duck when everyone can do it. <laughs> um, but yes, it, and, and 
hey, Bob, can you take a look at this? Well, then I did, oh, never mind, thank you. Um, but when I say make three hypotheses, hypotheses, it's things like, I forgot to initialize a variable. Um, there's a race condition. Um, I didn't pass the variable correctly. I misspelled the variable name. You know, hy hypotheses like that, just simple, simple things. And I generally found that my errors were in the class of incorrectly set a variable, incorrectly did not set a variable. And that's one of the hardest ones to catch. Uh, passed incorrectly, and I forget what the other one was. But you, you do this enough times and, and you start to, to you just write down the, the hypotheses that come up over and over again. And you say, that one, no, that one's not this. Oh, that could be. All right. Uh, thank you, Ducky. Uh, we have one more talk left. Uh, and this is uh, Julie. And she will be doing oh, uh, data science in the brain. What deep learning has to learn from the neocortex. Uh, now, uh, do you want me to give you the hand signals? I have auto advancing slides. Oh, right. So, yes. so okay. we'll see how this goes. Um, <laughs> apologies in advance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but just before I start this, um, I want to to uh, give a little preface because I, I learned that I can. Um, yeah, I am I am deeply unqualified to give this talk. Uh, as, as other people have said, um, I have no background in neuroscience. I have no background in biology. My background is math and computer science. So uh, I might say some stuff wrong. Um, I'm going to present a really weird theory that isn't mine in about six minutes, um, but uh, I'll be talking really fast, but please correct me in the Q&A if you have uh, a background and push back against things I say. Uh, I think this stuff is really neat, but I'm a total noob. So let me just start my start my auto advance. All right. So I was inspired to give this talk because um, when I started learning about neural networks, I was basically told they're biologically inspired. And I thought that was cool. Um, but I did not in any way kind of confirm this. Um, but my COVID hobby has been to read about neuroscience and I'm getting really interested in AGI. And I'm coming across some weird theories that kind of disprove some things that I'm, that I'm learning about. Uh, and so I wanted to present presented to everyone um, and because it helps me learn more to give talks. So the biological inspiration comes from this idea of neurons in a network. That's the way our brain does stuff. Um, neurons, whether they be mathematical or biological, take a bunch of inputs um, in from the dendrites. Um, they do some sort of computation and they uh, explode something at the other side, maybe. If it's electricity, it may or may not. Um, in the, the artificial neural network sense, we arrange these neurons in layers that feed forward. And if we have more than one of these layers, we say that we have a deep network. So we can do some pretty cool stuff that are analogs of the way that, that people do. Um, so we have uh, UNET and YOLO, which do vision tasks. Uh, and we, if we look at these architectures, we can see that uh, a couple of things, we've got really deep networks that are really, really dense. Uh, and this is sort of the secret sauce of deep neural networks um, because what we're doing by having all of these deep networks is having something called hierarchical feature maps. So it's assumed that at the lower layers, so closer to the input, we have these like really fine grain or like really small details that are sharp, but are represent things like wiggly lines or something being there. And then as we go further along in our in our layers, we have a, a, a broader view, like a perhaps like a prototypical whole face. It's kind of blurry. Um, so we can ask the question, like, does this come from the brain? Um, I was told this is biologically inspired, and it kind of does. Uh, in the visual region of the brain, uh, which is at the back of our head, we have a couple of different um, layers, V1 through a lot of Vs. So if you look at V1, um, you get these really crisp, uh, small details. So kind of like looking through a straw. You don't see a whole lot, um, but it's in really crisp detail. And then it gets really blurry and fuzzy when you go up these, these layers. So cool. We have this like kind of hierarchical system, right? Like that's, we're bi biologically inspired. This is how it works. So uh, if we take a second and look back 
at, at what we're looking at here, we have this view of intelligence in our brain, which says that um, we take um, data coming in from the sensor, um, and then we we extract some features and we only get a representation of an object at the very top. So there's a couple things I want to point out. Um, in this case, the senses are split up. So we have hierarchical models for each sense. Sight is different than, um, say, touch. And kind of, we have the whole layer involved. We, are, we have a lot of computing going on. So let's ask some questions about the brain. Is the cortex hierarchical? Um, this is a representation of the interconnectivity of a monkey brain. You can see, or the visual center of a monkey brain. You can see that there's kind of some hierarchy. We've got the Vs connecting to each other, but there's like a lot of other stuff. Uh, we have a lot of connections kind of going all over the place. Some of those aren't even visual areas. So about 95% of neurons don't fit into the strict hierarchy. So what's going on? Um, and we can also ask, does the cortex exhibit dense activation? The answer is no. Um, if you look at all of the possible synaptic connections, what's happening at any given moment is about 2% of them are active. So, okay, if we don't have this whole like area firing, because V1, as we saw, is more than 2% of the brain. Um, so if we don't have this whole area firing, sort of what, what is the unit that's actually firing? So I'm gonna introduce this idea to you of a cortical column. They don't actually look like this, but it's a pretty good representation. You can think of a cortical column as a set of about a hundred neurons that are less than a millimeter away from each other that um, have a lot of connections up and down. So vertical connections. Um, it, it's kind of like a small weak neural network a small weak learner. Uh, and we have about 150,000 of these in the brain. So with this representation, I'm gonna to present to you a theory that's called the thousand brains theory of intelligence. So it says that instead of extracting features, what we're actually doing at every layer is we have each of these cortical columns actually voting. They have a full idea of the world and they're a full model. Um, they come out, they spit out an object at the end. And really the, what this interconnectivity is, is a voting layer. So this explains um, why we have all of this crosstalk between senses because we're not limited to this hierarchy within a single sense. And um, it, it's it's pretty cool. Um, it, it's it's a neat sort of a way of explaining what's going on, and I don't think it's too far fetched to to point out. We have some like MNIST models that are only a couple hundred neurons that have like 95% accuracy. So you don't need a lot of neurons to do a lot of stuff. Um, and there's some really cool, I think, consequences of this theory that isn't mine um, that I'd like to point out. So one is that sparsity is key. In, in this sort of um, thousand brains theory, it's literally a thousand out of the, the 150,000 cortical columns that are doing stuff. So this is really a sparse representation in the brain. And we see in neural networks over and over and over again how great sparsity is. Dropout is great for training. We can straight up remove weights, set them to zero, and networks work the same. So sparsity is really going to help us um, build networks that are cool. Uh, and I think another um, thing is ensembling. Ensembling is super underrated. When I started going to Kaggle meetups, I heard time and time and time again, this tale of six dudes who each made their own individual model and nobody could make a model that was very good um, solo. So they ensembled them together and they got something cooler out of it. And I, so I think that's an underrated skill. Um, if our brains are in fact working on this series of really like weak learners, we can leverage that super hardcore. So um, all of these are the theory of this guy named Jeff Hawkins. Uh, he's a super cool dude. Um, he invented the Palm Pilot. He, he runs a, a, an organization called Numenta. Um, and these are, these are sort of his theories with my opinions thrown in. Um, the, the deal with neuroscience is that there's a lot of data We've been poking at brains for a very long time. So we have a lot of data about what's going on, but we don't really have any theories to, to bring them all together. So he's doing super hard work of like tossing out theories and see if they, seeing if they stick. And um, I like his, I think they're pretty cool. So I wanted to share them with you. Nice, Done. thank you. Perfect. All right. The auto advancing slides are hard for the speaker to do, but they're very easy for the timekeeper. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? Uh, actually, ha, yeah, I will go start. 
Uh, I already saw that you put uh, put in for uh, another talk on neuro, uh, neuromorphic uh, computing. Now I have kind of vaguely heard of this. Could you give like a 10,000 foot view of what neuro, a neuromorphic computing is trying to do? Uh, I, I'm hoping to learn more about it because I don't actually uh, know, but it's, it's basically trying to mimic the brain um, and the way that actual biological neural networks work a little bit more than this like biologically inspired but actually not sort of network that we have now so that's that's the hundred thousand foot view cool. uh really interesting and a uh, great job in the auto advanced slides um <laughs> <laughs> that, that worked out well. So I, I, I think you presented some evidence. Um, I wasn't sure whether there was quest questions or evidence, but that the you know there is this hierarchical organization of vision perception, for example, where I think we we really aren't haven't learned very well from the cortex and the neocortex is how it learns. Uh, have you come across any of that? Like this, we use backprop, backpropagation for neural networks, uh, of course, computer neural networks. The brain doesn't seem to do anything like that, um, I, as far as I know, or I don't know. Is that in any way part of Jeff Hawkins' thinking or proposal? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to include it, but I was already at time. Um, Here's your chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Jeff Hawkins is a super cool dude. He has he has a lot of very interesting theories, um, and he has both a computer science background and a, a PhD in neuroscience, so he can marry these two worlds very, very nicely. But um, his sort of concept of how brains learns is um, everything in the brain is built in a framework. So... Um, it, it's, it's an incomplete sort of view, but the, the idea is your brain is apt, actively developing frameworks in order to understand the world. And this applies from everything to um, the coffee cup, which is fa his favorite example, um, saying like, if you have your finger on a coffee cup and you're looking at it, um, it's the framework of the coffee cup that sort of dictates if you move your finger across it, are you gonna be surprised or not? Um, a framework. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if I can explain it any better um, than than to say uh, it, it's sort of a model, a model of the world. If if you can if you can say that. Um, so the a coffee cup would be its own framework. Your house is its own framework. It's a bunch of context and a model that you can kind of fall back fall back on. Um, so so his idea of how brains actually learn is that over time we develop these frameworks and we put absolutely everything we know in them and that applies from the physical world to mathematics to love to language um you can sort of think of any anything that you know can exist in a framework and there's some neat examples of where this comes up um like there there's something there's actually um competitive memorization people who um try to remember like whole decks of cards or like abstract shapes. And one of the best techniques to do that is to imagine a place that you know well, like your house, and you construct this really elaborate scenario where you're walking through your house and you see these objects in different places. Um, and so that's an example of your brain putting something complex into a framework that it understands, which is your house. Um, so yeah, everything that people have mentioned in the chat are, are kind of what a framework is. It's not a super well-defined concept. Um, and the idea is that these these things get developed over time as we experience the world um, and form new synaptic connections and actually mostly prune them away. When you're a baby, you have way too many synaptic connections. That's why everything is upsetting because you really don't know what's going on. Um, and throughout the course of your life, you prune them back. Yeah, I actually uh, do have a background in neuroscience, so I'm happy to make a few comments. Yes, please do. Um, and I studied a little bit the, the visual system dur during my PhD. I think it's a really cool idea to, to um, combine the ideas of neuroscience with computer science. And I guess I just wanted to say um, one of the things in the visual system is, of course, that we have feedback connections and a lot of information from, for example, higher cognitive systems, or as you said, other senses is coming in and actually changes what happens in uh, V1, early visual cortex. So that's, um, and I think your talk also um, 
laid out how little we still know about the brain. And I think, yeah, it's, it's just such a black box still to us. And um, just wanted to say something about why that's the case. And I guess one of the big problems is that it's really hard to measure. So we can do a functional MRI in humans, um, but we're basically measuring at that point two to three percent changes in blood flow in the brain, and then assume it's it's um, some measure related to synaptic um, stuff happening. We can do EEG or MEG, but the spatial resolution is really poor. Um, and then, of course, you can you can measure real time brain activity in monkeys, but you can't stick electrodes all over a monkey brain. So you usually measure only in one location. So this, this whole idea of like networks and brain processing on a larger scale is something we still know very little about. So yeah, I think it's cool to think about it in that way. And I think um, neuroscience is heading a little bit in that direction that we're thinking more about networks and nodes across different areas in the brain because obviously one area can solve a problem by itself. So. That's really cool. And and how do you think that's a, evolving? Is that from like theories being applied to like data we already have, or is it from like finding new and better sources of data that we can see like clearer patterns and see how that's evolving? Um, yeah, I guess it's partly that our techniques for measuring brain activity are getting better. So we can do fMRI at, at a reasonably good spatial and temporal scale. Um, it's not great at all, but <laughs> it's getting better, the techniques. And then also, I think um, maybe academia is becoming more multidisciplinary and we have access to so much information and and people are thinking, yeah, coming with backgrounds from computer science and thinking about things in different ways than, than the, the early neuroscientists uh, who were, would, like, were looking at small areas. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for not correcting me or like, <laughs> I, it sounds like I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> no, not really. Which no. is awesome. Yeah. I, I have a, a, a kind of a question. I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Either of you please answer. So you, you had that, that diagram of uh, the brain, the visual system with the many different nodes. And I've always been curious how are those different nodes defined? Like at what point does the V6 become the V5D, et cetera? Is that a structural thing or is that just purely through like functional observation or something? Um, I, I am not the most qualified person to answer this question, but um, the, the structural differences in the cortex are pretty minimal from, from place to place. That's kind of a, a neat secret sauce of the, the cortex is that it effectively looks the same everywhere. There's some areas that um, have fewer layers or they're connected differently, but generally speaking, if you take a cross section, like a vertical cross section, you'll see six layers of neurons um, all across the cortex. And that is for every sensory motor area that's for your prefrontal cortex. Um, so that's one of the coolest things I think about um, how brains work is that you have this unit, this functional unit of, of thing that can do everything from speech to uh, audition and is very variable. Um, there have been studies of, of people um, who are born without sight um, repurpose visual areas um, to learn braille. So it's it's super flexible. Um, so I, I don't think it's a, a like a structural question. I think it's probably more of an imaging question. Yeah, I think it's it's a combination of anatomical and and functional work. So so yes, the cortex is like six layers everywhere. But there's it's also highly folded, right? If you see those brain images, it's like a very much bunched up. Um, and there's gyri and sulci, and so there's definitely some kind of anatomical structure and there's differences in gray matter and white matter density. So part of it is um, anatomical in that sense, from like really taking slices of the brain and looking at the very fine um, details of that. And some of it can be functional where, where, for example, oh, you present a visual stimulus and measure which which is uh, very simple light and measure which neurons are responsive to that 
um, feel that the monkey make an eye movement and measure which neurons are responsive to that and, and so forth and so on. And one really cool thing, like Julie, you mentioned um, blind people, their brains being repurposed. It also happens if you just blindfold a regular person. And after a little while, like it starts changing and their visual part of their brain gets started taking over by other things. And then you take off the blindfold and they got to go back to the beginning again. That's so cool. I did not know that it happened that fast. That is wicked. Yeah, our brains are highly plastic and, and for a good reason. If something happens, then then we can deal with it and we can learn things for that reason too. Uh, you've heard, you've probably heard the use it or lose it saying, and that's, that's related to connectivity in your brain. So, And I think that's one of the, the cool sort of things that, um, that um, deep learning can learn from the way that brains work because deep, like neural networks are pretty fragile in some ways. Um, like they're, if you just focus on visual systems, they're susceptible to like one pixel attacks or adding in some random noise that, you know, we looking at images were like, yeah, that's, that's still a monkey, but now it's being classified as a boat. Um, so the, the fact that brains are so robust in this way is something that I think will benefit these systems um, as we continue to develop them so that we don't have the, these, these fragile gods <laughs> that rule over us in, in terms of deploying um, deep networks in, in the wild. Yeah, yeah, that. And I'm also thinking of robotics and our movement control. That's more my background. Yeah. Um, which, in which case, we're also way more flexible than, than the robots that have been built so far. So, yeah. All right. And with that, uh, we are officially done. I'm going to leave. Uh, oh, actually, first of all, uh, I am going to post uh, once more uh, the uh, form to go sign up to do one of these. I think all the speakers did an amazing job. Uh, this is always tough to do over Zoom. But if people want to unmute and give everyone uh, like a, a round of applause or have the Zoom clap, uh, please go do that because this was really an amazing batch. So thanks a lot for doing this.